You know, um, we've been in search for someone to fill Karen's shoes, and they were really big shoes to fill. The youth group really loved her, and, you know, her career has taken her to more full time with that and less time for the youth ministry, and with regret she resigned. And uh, she'd been praying, and when she found out we had hired someone new, she said, see, it's just God's blessing on all of this and the decisions that are made. And Dave Lacey, come on up, Dave. Dave is our new pastor, Pastor Dave Lacey. Uh, apparently, he didn't get the memo that we dress down around here. And so, uh, but Dave looks great, doesn't he? Just give him a hand. He looks good. He looks good. He started uh, uh, his first day on the job. We took a dozen kids down to Cedar Point, and uh, I broke him in right, okay? <laughs> he rode the roller coasters, and uh, the kids loved him. Uh, in fact, on the way home, I told our congregation this a couple of weeks ago. I asked one of the students that was along with us, what was the best part of Cedar Point? After a moment of silence and contemplation, that student said, Talking with Dave. Now, is that powerful? I knew we had the right guy. And uh, so I, I think we as a church are going to be totally blessed. Dave has a day job. And as a day job, uh, he's a police officer in the city of Dearborn. Let's give him a hand. He's a first responder kind of guy. Is that right? All right. And uh, nowadays, though, he's on a desk job. So he works from 4.30 in the morning to 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, and so uh, he'll, but he has to work some Sundays, every other Sunday. And so he won't be here in the morning, even though he'll be here in the evening when we have our youth meetings and, and like, but all his evenings are free. Boy, so if you need somebody in the evening, all his evenings are free. <laughs> Gotta love this guy already. Dave is married and he has a wife and two children. And uh, his wife, Tanya, is here. Oh, Okay. All right. Yeah. She's the great woman behind this guy, all right? And there's two children. Gabriel is the oldest. Yeah. And he's nine. And then there's Gideon. Please, you better stand with Gideon. No? Okay. <laughs> Gideon is seven months. Come on, give him a hand. And uh, we're so blessed to have them. Dave is a graduate of uh, Liberty University in Ministry and World Outreach. And so he's got a heart uh, for ministry. And he has a, out, have, has a heart for missions, which we, we love around here because we are a very mission-oriented church. And uh, he's been ordained. And so we will refer to him as Pastor Dave around here. Okay, Pastor Dave. And so, Dave, I'm so glad you're going to be a part you, of our staff. Actually, you are. You're already on. And uh, so we're so blessed to have you here. Uh, and I've offered him the opportunity uh, to share with us what God's put on his heart. And he's chosen to stay with our theme of the great things of the Bible. Today, he's going to challenge us to have great faith. God bless you, brother. Do that now. Good morning. Hope you can hear me okay. All right, great faith. Last week we heard about uh, great boldness, and this kind of fits right in with that, because to have great boldness, we need great faith. Uh, you know, I got the opportunity to meet some really awesome uh, young people this last couple weeks, uh, being able to go down to Cedar Point and be a part of their Area 51 group was really cool, and the name Area 51 goes for being set aside for God, and I love that. I think that is so cool because we're not of the world, we're of God's kingdom. And being of God's kingdom comes with some very special and specific things that we have to be aware of. The world isn't always for us, they're watching us, they want to see what kind of people we are. And so going with that, how do we have great faith then when the world can be against us? So looking forward through the scriptures, I came up with five biblical principles to help us have that great faith. I'm going to go through them here real quick before we completely dive into each one specifically. But the first one is that we have to realize that we're not alone. God is with us. Us plus God is a majority. Believe it or not, there was biblical uh, figures 
people throughout history, of real history, real places back then, that struggled with that too. They thought they were the only ones for God when they really weren't and when God was actually with them. The second biblical principle of having great faith is to uh, profess with our mouths that God is our Savior, that Jesus is our Savior, and that's important because like a little child hearing something from their father and then later on throughout their lives repeating it, Dad, you remember you showed me this? God loves it when we show him that we have the great faith. And like I said before as well, it's also nice because people need to know who we are. We need, they need to know why we're set aside. They're looking for the reasons for our belief, and we should give them those reasons, obviously, with respect and uh, uh, dignity. Number three, the, the other way of having great faith and maintaining great faith is to understand that faith is worth more than any worldly item. Worldly items go away. I think it's interesting sometimes when a building goes abandoned, how quickly it seems that nature just kind of takes over. You see weeds and stuff growing up through the parking lot. You see trees growing through the actual structure. Nature takes over very quickly. Our earthly items decay and go away no matter what they are. The environment takes care of that, but the one thing that the earth can't take away is who you are in your faith. So it's important to understand that that's worth more because one day we all meet God and we'll have to answer for who we are and Jesus will exchange who we are for who he was. Also, another way of having great faith is by having the childlike faith. This is something that we hear about a lot. Childlike faith. That doesn't mean being blind to what is around us. It doesn't mean just blindly following something. It's understanding that God wants us to rely upon him. There's struggles in this world. There's difficulties. If there's one thing that's for certain in this world, it's that you're going to have problems. We've all had them. And in those problems, God wants you to lean on him because he'll take care of you. It's very important to have that childlike faith and understanding that God's going to take care of those issues. He'll use them for good. There's many reasons why problems can happen but he can turn those things around and use them for good, and we're going to explore that as well. But the other way to have great faith is by spending time with Jesus. So those are the five principles there. And leading off, uh, great faith, number one, is important to have the faith by realizing you're not alone. You're part of God's kingdom, And he will use your efforts for good. Anything you do for God is not going to be in vain. Okay. If we look towards Romans 8.28. Is that up there? I can't see there. There we go. Romans 8.28. We read what Paul says here. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purposes. If you've been called to do something, if you have something that God lays on your heart, he's not going to leave you alone. He's going to equip you for those tasks. Even when you feel that you don't have anybody else to help you, even when you feel that you can't accomplish it, if God lays that on your heart, he's going to help you out. One of the pastors that did my ordainment, Pastor Mike Rath, He said he's been uh, in ministry, in the vocational ministry for many years, and he told me that still to this day, he gets nervous before every sermon. He said, I'm not nervous at public speaking. It's the realization that you're being a mouthpiece for God. You're, You're discussing the word of God, and that is very important. And he said it's from the pew up to the pulpit that that nervousness goes away, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. God will equip us for those things that we need to do. He's not going to leave us there by ourselves, and we heard that today in our song, We Are Not Alone. In Genesis 50, verse 20, we see that uh, in the ancient world, in the Old Testament, Joseph was a son. 
He was betrayed by his family. They throw him into a well. They just talk about killing him first, and they sell him into slavery. He's taken to Egypt. And there he is a slave. He ends up getting falsely accused of something he didn't do and thrown into prison. So one bad thing leads to another, and it feels like he's probably all alone. Nobody else he knows is there with him. It's got to be tough. Sometimes it's easy to feel that way in the world. However, God used all of those things to not tear him down, but to lift him up. In Genesis 50, 20, we read, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done by the saving of many lives. Joseph ends up becoming the number two guy in all of Egypt, which at the time was the biggest and most powerful nation on earth. He ends up solving the problem of the famine and saving his own family, the people that cast him away. God can use all those things for good. And like I said, problems are going to happen. There is difficulty in life. Reverend Bobby Schuler has said before, and, and I, I love this statement, that when you make an ally out of God, you make an enemy out of Satan. It's one of my favorite sayings because it is so true. Satan wants to tear you down. He wants you to stop serving God. He'll do anything to try to make you walk away from God. But God can use all those negative things to help promote you. In my own life, I've had a lot of difficulties too. When I finally decided that it was time to step forward and serve God in more of a frontline manner, I prayed that God, here I am, send me. And my life has never quite been the same. I've had disease. My family's had issues. I was off for nine months out of a job because of my health issues. You know, we had to spend time in the hospital with my smallest son after he had some intestinal issues. But God used all those things and put them all in the right place to put me where I am today. And he used everything for good. And he can do that with anybody's life. It's not like it's just for me. It's not like I'm making this up. We can read example of example of people who had great faith where God promotes them. The apostles had great faith, and we read about them a lot too. With the apostles, though, it's interesting. I love the Bible because it's messy. It shows how a fallen world really is. It doesn't lie about who these people were. When talking to people who don't have the belief that we have in God, I love to use the inside-out approach. Because just telling somebody that it's in the Bible, so believe it, doesn't always work, right? Because, well, I don't believe that book, right? So using the inside-out approach, using history. Any good historical scholar will tell you that Jesus was a real person. He lived in the Roman Empire. He was executed by the Roman government. And shortly after that, there was an explosion in that region that reached the ends of the world that was a new religion based upon his teachings. This is accurate information. Even if you don't believe the Bible, this stuff is true. Before his execution, his disciples, all but one, John, fled. They ran away. They were afraid of being arrested by the Roman government. They were afraid of being tried and convicted and killed. A short three days later, if you have the belief, you know that Jesus was resurrected. That changed everything for them. They went from running away to proudly standing firm in their faith. They stood there in the face of the opposition, a Roman government who was very good at killing people, who knew what they were doing in keeping people under their foot. And that Roman government told them, you know, if, if you just say that you don't really believe this stuff, you've been causing problems, I know you believe it, but look, just, just say you're sorry, we'll give you some lashings, you might do some prison time, whatever. The disciples stood there strong with great boldness, as we heard last week, and having great faith, they said, no, I know this is real. I know in my heart of hearts that this is reality, that Jesus was sent here to save us from our sins and give us eternal life. And many of the disciples, obviously not John, he wrote the book of Revelation, but the rest of them were all executed by the Roman government. They'd rather be executed 
than lie and say, oh no, Jesus isn't real. What goes, takes a person from running in fear to suddenly standing firm within three days? Actual true belief, great faith. They had that great faith. We should also have that great faith. And even though some of the disciples had problems and struggled, and some of the figures throughout history sometimes don't always have the best uh, faith, it shows the messiness and when they screwed up because it's difficult out there and sometimes we mess up. We're all not worthy. But it shows that. John the Baptist doubted at one point and had his followers talk to Jesus. Herod thought that, no, oh, Jesus is probably just some uh, uh, prophet or he's, he's uh, the reincarnated Jesus. The people of Nazareth where Jesus grew up thought he was just maybe a prophet. I, he's not really the son of God. So we're going to face opposition and we're going to face some doubt from time to time, but having great faith means realizing that we're not alone. Okay? Sometimes we also see that we have unrealistic expectations of how our life is going to turn out. God knows every step that's before us. He, he's seen the entire world from start to finish, so nothing is a surprise to him. Growing up, I remember all the action movie, movies from the 80s, Arnold Schwarzenegger and you know all that, where they, they'd have an Uzi and they'd hip shoot everybody from the hip, and the, the bad guys would shoot at them in thousands of rounds and never hit the, the good guy because they were just that good not realistic, is it? We seem to think uh, in our minds that we're going to walk out there into the world and things are just going to go our way. But they don't. A lot of times there is going to be problems, and having that great faith means praising God's name during those difficulties. That's what King David did. We see that, and King David's quoted a lot in the Bible. King David is persecuted by his mentor Saul. He's persecuted by his own son who tries to take the kingdom from him. And when he's in the wilderness running for his life from his own son, he praises God. He sings the songs of Psalms and he praises God. He thanks them. Even though things are difficult right now, I know I'm not alone. You're here with me. You're going to use this all for your good. If we look forward towards the book of James, Jesus' uh, half-brother, who happened to be the leader in the church in Jerusalem, we see him writing about having great faith along with those works. He tells us about being the physical example for great faith. He says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If someone says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In this way, faith by itself is not accomplished by its actions, is dead. And we can say that we believe, but if we don't actually believe in our heart, we show that on the outside. Some people say they believe, and they only say that because it was popular at one point. We don't see that quite as much anymore. But I remember talking to somebody at one point, and he said, oh, yeah, I'm a believer. I'm going to heaven. I said, oh, okay, cool. He said, because my mother is a deacon or a deaconess. And that was his reasoning for feeling that he was going to heaven. Meanwhile, he was just been arrested for armed robbery, and selling drugs. And sometimes we do lose our way. There is addiction out there in the world, and people, good believers, sometimes make mistakes. Maybe your faith is relatively new, and you're trying to mature your faith, and you're trying to overcome an addiction, and you've backslidden. It happens. There's many addictions out there in this world, not just the drugs and alcohol. There's addictions to social media now. There's addictions to having to work money. There's addictions to pornography. All these things out there are keeping your eyes away from God and doing your best, repenting, and honestly saying, I'm sorry, I don't want to do this again is important. Now, sometimes you may backslide. That doesn't mean that you don't believe. It means you need to keep fighting those addictions. It's, it's difficult. Have somebody be a partner with you to keep you moving forward, but keep fighting it don't stop. You're not alone. (sighs) 
you know, it's funny, later on in that passage, God talks about what belief is, and belief is the faith that you put in God. It's not just saying you believe in God. James continues to say in verse 19, you believe there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Satan knows God's real, yet he doesn't align himself with God. He's separate from God. So just believing in God is one thing, but having the faith in God is difficult. It's hard. So we have to continue to push. So number two, the second biblical principle, excuse me, of having great faith is to profess our faith with our mouths as God and the world are watching. Let's see here if I can get this right. <laughs> there we go, thank you. Uh, in Matthew 8, verse 5, we hear about the centurion. Now, the centurion had great faith. He was an outsider. He wasn't of the Jewish faith. And during this time, Jesus was moving his ministry from the Jewish people, the Hebrews, to the Gentiles. The Hebrews were meant to be the light to the world. They were supposed to show great faith to the world, but they kept messing up. So in Matthew 8, verse 10, it says, When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering greatly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and he will be well. He will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, my soldiers under me. I tell them to go and they go. I tell them to come and they come. I tell my servant to do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come and go from the east and from the west will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now here he's talking about the people that reject him, the people that were supposed to be the light to the world and continue to walk away from God. He says, but the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God also tells us in scripture that he can take a rock and turn it into the child of Abraham. Like the example of the person saying, I'm going to heaven because my family member believes. It doesn't, it's not enough just to have the right blood in your veins. God can make any of us into believers with that great faith. And it's important to continue to have that great faith. Like the centurion. In Luke 7, 9, that's the other chapter uh, with this same incident, it talks about how the centurion even built temples. He had great faith even though he was from outside he realized who Jesus was. Jesus was the fulfillment of scripture. He wasn't just a man that was sent here to do some miracles. Jesus was sent here to fulfill the prophecy, show us that he was God and die for our sins. Number three, the third biblical principle of having great faith is by understanding that a steadfast faith is worth more than any earthly item. Here I'll talk about 1 Peter in the first verse of 7.10, the book of Peter, he talks a lot about, excuse me, he talks a lot about having faith in pagan societies, having faith when we have difficult times. Peter's a great person to listen to, obviously. He's gone through quite a bit. And Peter says, your faith is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire. This results in praise, glory, and honor with Jesus Christ, who is revealed, though you have not seen him, you love him. This is important. He had to get faith by watching this. We don't have the honor of watching Jesus in his earthly ministry at the time. When I was down in Cedar Point, I got the opportunity to talk to one of the kids and through our discussion we talked about some of our backgrounds 
my background, I was very fortunate. I had an uncle who was a pastor. I had parents who are here today that took me to church every week. I had that, I was surrounded by people of great faith, which helped me when I was growing up. It's difficult, especially these days, in a world that seems to be growingly pagan and, and, and anti-God in many ways. And talking to this young man, he said, yeah, you know, he goes, I see a lot of people that just don't understand why I believe what I believe. I can understand saying how easy it is for somebody to disregard God's teachings when they didn't have the same upbringing that I did. So seeing somebody that grew up without that still follow in God's footsteps, still have great faith, is amazing to me. Truly a blessing. In 2 Peter, he talks about living in the pagan society and being a godly follower. In chapter 2, verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's sweet, isn't it? We're his possession. And he's going to equip us to do his works, his deeds, whatever he needs done. If he gives you a calling, he's going to equip you to do it. It's very important. Number four, the fourth biblical principle of having great faith is having that childlike faith. This particular portion of scripture that I have is Matthew 15, verse 28. I love this portion of scripture, although sometimes it's taken out of context. I recently watched a video of a guy who tried to say that this particular section of the word of God was showing Jesus being a racist, which couldn't be further from the truth. One thing I can urge you, if, if you're reading scripture, don't just read one verse. Read before the verse, read after it, get context. In any book, we read before and after. We don't just open up a science book and read one sentence and think to know that we understand everything about science. You have to read before and after to fully understand. If you are doing math, you're not going to start out with calculus. You're going to start out before that. And it's important to read the scriptures in context. But here in this particular passage, Jesus leaves the area of the Hebrew nation, and he goes up to Tyre and Sidon, which is modern-day uh, Lebanon. This is an area which was pagan initially. They rejected God. They had multiple gods. And it says here that leaving that place, Jesus came, withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, and that's important that it's a Canaanite woman as well, as the Canaanites were in the land and had rejected God. They were at odds with the Hebrew people oftentimes. So it's important that he identifies who she was. But she came crying out, saying, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer her. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out to us. He answered, I was sent only for the sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, have mercy on me. He replied, it's not right to take the bread from the children and toss it to the dogs. And that's the part that gets misconstrued. Jesus isn't talking about taking it from one race to another. He's talking about taking away from believers and giving to non-believers. Like I said before, Jesus wasn't sent here just to do some miracles. Jesus was sent here to fulfill prophecy and to be the light to the world. And this is where his ministry begins to go from trying to work with the Hebrews to moving forward to the Gentiles, the rest of us, if you're not Hebrew. Uh, and the woman replies to Jesus, said, Yes, Lord, it is. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Jesus heard this and said, Woman, you have such great faith. And guys, if you're married, I don't necessarily recommend you use that line on your wife. Woman, do this. I kind of do that with my wife sometimes. She knows I'm just joking and not serious, but this is the Son of God speaking here. Uh, he says, you have such great faith, your request is granted, and your daughter will be healed in that very moment. 
Jesus isn't talking about her race. He's talking about a nation that rejected him. With this, she shows Jesus her great faith. She says, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus is in the line of David, the tribe of Judah. So that way, she shows him that she understands. She follows in line with a lot of leaders of great faith, such as Ruth, who came from outside. Moses' wife came from somewhere else other than the Hebrew people. We see this many times over. When you are part of the community, you're not alone. You're part of that community of believers. She showed him that she was part of the community, that she just didn't want a miracle just because, oh, hey, this miracle worker's coming in, just do me a miracle. She showed him that she really wanted him as a savior, and he rewarded her great faith. In 2 Kings, it begins at uh, 17, I believe it goes to 19. Uh, it's not part of the slide, but we see the story of Elijah. And Elijah, or sorry, excuse me, not Elijah, I take that back. Hezekiah, the, the king Hezekiah, he's the 13th king of Israel. Hezekiah has great faith. Now, at that time, the nation of Israel is divided into the north and the south. They mess up, they have all sorts of issues in their nation, and the northern nation retains the name of Israel. The southern nation is the nation of Judah. During that time, the Assyrians are a big empire, they're very brutal. They have the biggest army, they're the strongest, they're the bullies. And the Assyrians come in and take over the northern nation of Israel. The southern nation of Judah has Hezekiah as their new king. He's a godly man. He tears down the idols. He tears down all the stuff that uh, uh, they're doing wrong. And he tries to be a good person. He prays. During this time, the king of Assyria, King Sennacherib, comes in and takes over a couple of cities in Judah. King Hezekiah tries to appease him. He takes all the gold from the palace and he gives all the gold to the Assyrian people, but that's not enough. They come in and they say, no, we want more. We want your women. We want your towns. We want to deport you. And King Hezekiah prays. The Assyrian army comes to their doorstep with a gigantic army. Several hundred thousand people come to their doorstep. And up comes three of their leaders. There's the commander of the army, the field commander, and the commander of his empire come up to discuss things with the leaders of Judah. And out from Judah comes the court secretary, a reporter, and the palace administrator. Now, seeing this in, in 2 Kings, I think it's kind of funny because when you think about it, how terrified would those guys have been? Here you are, a court reporter walking out of the safety of uh, the walls of Judah out there into the open. Here's a couple hundred thousand people, battle-hardened, the biggest, most dangerous army there is, and three main leaders of the army back in a time when the leaders had to be the best warriors there was. These guys are battle-hardened, tough dudes, and these guys are standing there before them, and here you are, a pencil pusher. Hmm. Had to be a little intimidating. So they go up and the field commander of the Assyrian army speaks first and he says, don't listen to Hezekiah. He's going to lead you astray. Don't listen to your God because what other God of other nations saved them? And the court reporter even tells the Assyrians, look, can you please speak in Aramaic? We, we understand it well. We don't want the, the rest of the people to hear what you're saying. I said, no, we're going to continue to speak in Hebrew because we want them to hear us. This is a warning. Don't let your king deceive you. We're going to come in and take over. To them, all, all hope must have been lost. You have an army that's ten times bigger. You have people ready to lay siege. They've conquered everything in their path, and nothing has been able to stop them, and they're at your doorstep telling you, don't be deceived. It was probably difficult to have great faith then. But they go in, and they don't say a word, and they go back to Hezekiah, and they weep, and they say, oh, this is a day of distress. They knew that the nation had made mistakes in the past, and they were worried those mistakes were coming back to haunt them. Now, during that time, Hezekiah goes to the temple of the Lord. He spends time with Jesus, which is number five in the, the lessons of great faith, is spending time with Jesus, and we'll get back to that, but he goes and prays. Isaiah, excuse me, gets sent to Hezekiah, and he tells him, don't worry. 
the Lord's going to take care of your problem for you. King Sennacherib is going to be sent back to his city. He's going to go into his palace, and he's going to be killed by the sword. Don't worry, it's fine. That's got to be tough to listen to and think, yeah, this is going to happen when you have a couple hundred thousand people surrounding your city. You have more people, they've got more experience, they know what they're doing, and they're confident they're going to take you over. During this time, another army decides they are going to attack the camp of Assyria. And it distracts King Sennacherib for a moment, and he even sends one of his servants back to tell Hezekiah again, eh, don't be too confident. This is just temporary. We're still coming back for you. We haven't forgot about you. And Hezekiah again goes and he prays, give us great faith, Lord. Be with us. The angel of the Lord, it says, goes and kills 185,000 of the Assyrian army troops in their camp. And King Sennacherib has no choice but to leave. And he goes back to his city called Nineveh, which is the capital city of Assyria. And he goes and goes to the temple of his false god named Nisroch. And in there, as he's worshiping his false god, two of his sons come in and kill him with the sword, just like Isaiah had promised. Hezekiah had great faith. He had time with Jesus. It's important to spend time with Jesus. Having that great faith and having time with Jesus uplifts us. I try to set aside about 15 minutes every single day to sit down uninterrupted in a room where I can just communicate with God because we're not alone, number one. Give him my worries, my fears, and thank him for the blessings that I do have. Because even in the difficulties, we've still got it pretty good, most of us. And God will use those difficulties to uplift us and not tear us down. Whatever difficulties you might have in your life, I hope that it uplifts you. I hope that you continue to have great faith and push forward and believe in God. Let these people be an example to you that even when things look like they're over, they're not. In between First and Second Kings is the story of Elijah. And Elijah tries to steer his nation back on the right track. And he sets up an altar and says, who here believes in God? And everybody's quiet. Nobody wants to come forward. They're afraid of being canceled. We see that today, right? Everybody's afraid of what uh, is going to happen on Facebook or Snapchat or whatever if they profess their faith. Then everybody was quiet and they didn't want to be canceled either. He says, okay, fine. He goes, how about this? I'll set up my altar. The false gods can set up their altar or prophets. We'll put bulls on both and see whose God devours it with fire. And of course, the God of Israel, our God, devours the sacrifice with fire. Elijah prays and a big storm rolls in. And even though the evil king at that time, Ahab, opposed him, he had no alternative but to, to leave. Elijah, even after seeing all these major miracles in front of him leaves and the queen at the time the evil queen jezebel puts a death warrant out for elijah and what does he do he flees he faces off a nation and an evil king but one woman threatens his life and he's gone man just saying uh <laughs> ain't no wrath right um <laughs> god has to give him some great faith to pick him up and dust himself off Sometimes we need that. Be a community together. Be a community with each other because we all need to rely on somebody. When King Sennacherib is telling the Hebrew people in 2 Kings what he's about to do, he says, don't lean on any of these other nations because they're like a broken staff. It's like leaning on a broken piece of wood. It cuts your hand. But being a good person, being a good member of the church, being a good leader for God and a part of his kingdom you're more like a wall. Somebody can lean up against you. God wants you to rely on him completely because he'll take care of you. So the five biblical principles that we have to have great faith is to have great faith, we have to realize we're not alone, just like the song said. That's interesting, too, because that was not planned. <laughs> Amy did that all on her own. That was just happened to be perfect. I think that's God telling us something. We have great faith by professing our faith with our mouth. We have great faith by understanding that it is worth more than any earthly item. We have great faith 
by having childlike faith, understanding that we can rely on God and he is there for us. And we have great faith by understanding that we need to spend time with God in communication. In closing, I'm also a uh, Adopt-A-Cop coordinator, and out in the lobby, I put a couple of cards. And the Adopt-A-Cop Ministries is kind of cool. It was started by a former uh, retired state trooper sergeant who's also an ordained minister. He wants to surround every police officer out there with prayer. So he wants individuals or families to sponsor a, a police officer and pray for that specific police officer daily. If you'd like to be a part of it, I would appreciate it. You can fill out one of those cards and either toss it under the door of my office or give it to uh, Kelly and uh, I can sign you up. There's no financial obligations or anything like that. Um, you can also go to the website, which is adoptacop.org, uh, pretty simple, and uh, uh, sign up there. And I'm working to get police officers signed up so that way it's kind of mutually beneficial. Both sides get something out of it. Here we get to remember somebody who sacrificed for our country and for our community, and the police officer gets to remember that there's a God above him or her and gets surrounded by prayer. They wear body armor to save them physically. They need spiritual saving too. They need God's protection, which is even more protection than what the body armor can give them. So I'd like to close in prayer. If you don't believe in God and you want to give your heart to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. Lord, I pray that your words touch these people. I pray that if somebody here doesn't believe in you, that they can give their heart to you by saying, I have the faith. I have great faith and I'm willing to step forward with great boldness and give you my heart, my allegiance, and I believe in your word, Lord. I believe you're, you are the only God for me and you are my Savior. I thank you for my blessings, Lord. I thank you for these people here and if you pray that prayer, I believe that you've been saved. Lord, help these people, uplift them, be with them, show them they're not alone, Lord. In your glorious name we pray, amen. I'd like to thank everybody here again today. I appreciate my first time with you and hopefully uh, you enjoyed it. Have a good Sunday morning. Thank you.